Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, video conference entitled uh, Roman and Byzantine Christmas uh, Traditions. We're all very excited to have you here with us uh, today and uh, we all uh, looking forward to Christmas, okay. Uh, let's begin by introducing uh, the After Constantine Journal. Uh, actually, it's a journal that focuses on late antiquity and highlights the era. Uh, late antiquity is a period of time that is often uh, misunderstood. Many people believe that it was a time of great uh, turmoil and upheaval, when uh, in reality it was a time of great uh, change and transformation. It was a time uh, when the uh, Roman Empire was crumbling and the barbarian inventions were beginning. Uh, it was also a time when uh, Christianity was uh, spreading throughout the world and becoming the dominant religion. Uh, late antiquity was a time of great change, but it was also a time of great beauty. The art and the architecture of this period has, are some of the most beautiful and iconic in all of history. Uh, if you want to learn, of course, about uh, the late antiquity, there are many resources available online and in libraries. So our work is to bring the history of late antiquity to the audience for free by creating an open access base and to create an ecumenical dialogue between the late antique and medieval issues that will help us understand the era and improve our knowledge of it. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen for a bit and show you the journal. Okay, here it is. You can find it at uh, the address uh, www.afterconstantine.com. And you can see all the events we have, the issues, uh, the submission deadline, uh, the partners and collaborators. Uh, you can contact us, of course. Okay, let me stop sharing. And uh, now let's move on to our first uh, speaker for today, Mr. Mark, Mark uh, Boomer. Let me say a few things about Mark. Uh, Mark Boomer uh, studied his uh, master uh, degree in ancient history at Radboud University. And currently he works on a PhD about the ritual dynamics of temple sleep in late antiquity at Charles University. Uh, today is going to present us uh, a presentation about uh, the ancient practices of uh, Christmas. So we're looking forward to hearing to hear, hearing the here. Okay, so Mark, the floor is yours. Excuse you. me, before we start, should I uh, read? Uh, oh, of the... course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you have a great degree. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm please, sorry. Excuse yeah. me, Mark. Excuse no problem, me. no problem. But uh, yes, uh, as uh, Dr. Zorbas is, uh, it's not possible to join us uh, today, uh, I have to read his uh, greetings. Okay. Uh, well, we welcome you all on behalf of His Eminence, the Metropolitan of Kisamos in Selinon, Amphilochios, and then General Director of the Orthodox Academy of Crete, Dr. Constantino Zorbas. The Orthodox Academy of Crete is a research and conference center which serves the local and international community since 1968, with special focus on the issues of theology, culture, science, environment, and of course, uh, history. Today, our subject is uh, very important because it introduces us into the Christmas period, but through the late antiquity texts. We owe a great deal of knowledge of the antiquity of the people of this period. Uh, According to Peter Brown, the transition to Christianity reveals a period of remarkable, remarkable and rather unexpected creativity in the Greek world of later antiquity. This transition reflects the change in the way in which in recent decades, scientific experts uh, perceived the early years of decline of the Western Roman Empire. There was life after the third century and, the, and this life was called late antiquity. We would like to thank Mrs. Tiamis for editing of the digital journal After Constantine, which is an important tool for the study of later antiquity, hosting scientific work of young researchers who promote classical and, um, and Byzantine studies 
and contribute to the enrichment of this period. We also thank her for organizing today's event. We also like to deeply thank all the speakers of the today event. Today we have Mark Boimer, Mark Elliott, Vania Loza, uh, Lozanova, uh, Georgi Pap. So we're, we're expecting to hear your uh, contributions and, and enrich us with your, your speech and uh, your uh, deep knowledge regarding this period. So in view of the metropolis of the holidays, without many lights, but with enlightened people, we wish to all to celebrate Christmas in a true way and from the heart so that the new year 2023 will be better from the one which is coming to its end and that everyone will stand on the battles of depth and duty with faith, love, solidarity and strength. Mrs. Tiamis, you have the floor. It would be good if you did a short summary at the end of each presentation so that our online friends could follow in a better way. Thank you very much for this today's event. Thank you, too. Uh, we would like to thank Mr. Zerbas for his uh, greeting, although he could not be here with us today. But uh, you are Mr. Kalogiraki, so <laughs> that's pretty much the same. Uh, okay, so Mr. Boomer, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I will share my screen. Let's see, where is it? Yes. Okay. I have to take this a bit away. Yeah. All right, so um, good morning to you all from the Netherlands. Uh, I'll be giving a lecture today titled From Mitras to Jesus, Ritual Dynamics of Christmas, and I will be focusing on Jesus. So first, uh, in general, what do we know about Jesus uh, when we think of him? Well, first, of course, it is said that he was born on December the 25th, although it's not biblical. Uh, there is a lot of discussion whether he was born or not. According to Kurt Simmons, due to chronological sources, it should be dated on the 25th of December, but there is still a lot of debate because in scholarship, uh, we distinguish between the religious Jesus and the historical Jesus, and mostly from a historical point of view, it is argued that he was born in 4 BC and died circa 30 AD. Further, he was born of God and Mary, which makes him technically a demigod if we leave away all the theological discussions about his nature. Then it is also said that he was born in a stable between all kinds of animals. There's also some critique, some other scholars say no, it definitely was a cave instead of a stable. So there is also some discussion about that. Further, he is associated with light and the sun, as you can see, of course, about the sun beneath this, his head in this picture, the halo. Other associations concerning the drinking of blood during the Eucharist in the form of wine, of course. And because Jesus was resurrected, uh, he is known, according to James Fraser, as a dying and rising deity. And in this presentation, I will try to answer the question, which gods influence the cult, rituals, and iconography of Jesus? But before I go to that question, I first want to say something about ritual dynamics. Uh, ritual dynamics is actually the core element of the interdisciplinary field of ritual studies, which was founded in the 80s by Professor Ronald Grimes. Um, the current uh, stance is that rituals are not static phenomena, which was issued until the 60s of the 20th century, but that rituals are always changing, involving and developing. Ritual studies collects many different, uh, different theories from various disciplines, such history, theology, economy, politics, philosophy. And they look at questions at how do rituals rise? How do they disappear? Uh, what theories are there? Which perspectives are possible, et cetera, et cetera. Important scholars are of course, Ronald Grimes, the founding father 
also Catherine Bell, who died unfortunately way too soon in 2008. And in the Netherlands, we have Paul Post, now Emeritus Professor of Ritual Studies. We have several models of ritual dynamics. The first is Christianization, which I will say something more uh, in a moment. Another model is inculturation or acculturation, which was developed in the Netherlands by Professor Gerard Lucke at Tilburg University, meaning the implementation of cultural elements from top down and bottom up. Then we have the cult and ritual transfer to other locations. What happens when we transfer rituals or cults? How does the environment react? How do people react? How does it interfere with other religions? Syncretism, of course, although some scholars argue that it's a problematic concept, I think it all depends on how you define it. Then, of course, the change in continuity, which we historians, of course, always use in scholarship. And then, uh, since 2017, we have in the Netherlands the Anchoring Innovation Project, founded by Leiden University. It combines two concepts, innovation and anchoring, and it looks at ways in how we can persuade people to accept new forms of ancient content. And finally, uh, we, read a, we read, a, read a lot about the invention of tradition, according to Hobsbawm, of course, which also has a link with the founding of new rituals. But first to the Christianization process, which will be my um, focus today. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, said about this Christianization uh, process, but to me, we have to be a, a bit careful about when we speak about Christianity and the whole process. To me, we can only speak about real Christianity from the fourth century AD onwards. And before that, between the first and fourth century, we can speak about Christiani more or followers of Jesus. This whole process took place, of course, in the ancient world, which was connected by the Mediterranean and shows a lot of examples of ritual dynamics in which form versus content are being discussed and interacted by all the relations. To me, after studying uh, almost a year with all kinds of literature and perspectives, I will define Christianization as the process in which various stages are successfully passed between the first and fourth centuries. These are mission, evangelism, and enculturation. From the fourth century onwards, Christianization is a continuous process in which a transformation took place from a personal, inner, and voluntary perspective via a bottom-up approach, conversion, and from a group-based, top-down, forced conversion process, which I will define here as Christianization. In, in Dutch, we have a different concept, but it's translated into Christianization in English. And these phases can be placed under the concept of inculturation. With this brings me the forced uh, aspect to the so-called conflict model between non-Christians and Christians. Um, it has been a model which is described by scholars regularly, um, hinting, of course, about the struggle between the two groups. But since a couple of years, there are new perspectives, like in the book of Marianne Sagi and Edward and Schoolman in their book, Pagans and Christians in the late Roman Empire, where they argue that there is now a paradigm shift going on in the portation of the relation between this non-Christian and Christian world, and which should have replaced the old conflict model with other processes like multiculturalism, cooperation, and group cohesion. Although I do support this new vision, I do see in my research still this conflict model between the two groups. And I think we will also see that when we look at the iconography of Jesus and his identity. So, but why Christmas? How did, how did we got Christmas? There are several theories about it. The first is that some bishops were responsible because they want to defeat Helios, Apollo, or Sol Invictus 
by portraying Jesus as yeah the sun god uh, in some way uh, it, sh it should be connected to the emperor Aurelian in 274 who founded the temple and this whole process is being defined as solar syncretism on the right above we see Jesus depicted as a sun Christ and beneath we see the real Helios Apollo Another reason for Christmas could be cosmological reasons, which are related to the right date of birth of Christ, but also to Easter. And finally, it is argued that the Emperor Constantine celebrated Christmas for the first time. But according to Simmons, it is not true because he wasn't in Rome at that time. But maybe we will hear about that in a moment with the next lecture. There are two other theories connected to Christmas. First is the history of religions theory, which explains how Christianity came about and how it was rooted in non-Christian elements like rituals. But although it seems plausible, not every Christian faith has non-Christian roots. The second theory is the so-called calculation theory, which looks at the birth of Christ from the moment of Annunciation on March 25th and then count until the December 25th when he was born. Unfortunately, although both theories offer some interesting elements, they cannot explain the whole process fully. It is argued that we should have a better look at the role of apostles versus historical sources, which eventually would confirm December 25th as date of birth. With this in mind, I will go to the gods who, in my view, influence the cult rituals and iconography of Jesus. First, we have Mithras, a Persian light god, who of course was born on the 25th of December in a cave from a god and a mortal. He was associated with light and sun. And in that perspective, he is also described as a sun god. Other Epithets are that he is an invincible god, he cannot be defeated. Of course, there is a blood sacrifice in his cult when he was killing the bull, and his cult lasted between the first and fifth century, which makes him an influential and important god. Next god, we already discussed a bit, the Roman Sol Invictus, counterpart of the Greeks Helios Apollon, was also born on the 25th of December. On winter solstice is also being portrayed as an invisible sun god. He had the ability to heal. And we even have a reference to Sol Invictus Mitras, which of course offers a connection with the Persian god. And his god lasted until the sixth century. Sol Invictus was, as we have seen, a very important god and uh, a competition for Jesus. Then another god from Egypt, Osiris, according to the sources, if you should accept it, also born on the 25th of December. He is seen as equivalent of Dionysus. He became the god of the underworld, of course. And he was killed by Set, torn into pieces, spread over all Egypt, but was reassembled by Isis, which makes him also a rising and dying god if we take Fraser's theory into this. And his cult should last it until the fifth century. Then we go to Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and orgiastic rituals and plants. Also born on 25th of December, he is of course associated with wine. He was first killed and reborn. But also we see the bull and blood as elements of his cult. And of course, he is seen as equivalent of Osiris. And when I was reading about his cult, I saw that until the 19th century, there were churches of Dionysus. And so he was an extremely popular god, even after late antiquity, after the Byzantine period. And finally, maybe not expected, we have Asclepios, who started maybe as a king and then as a demigod. He was born of course of Apollo and Coronis. He 
is also symbolized as the sun. He was, of course, a healing god. His cult was founded in Epidauros, where he was a protagonist in the temple sleep ritual, where patients visit his temples and being healed in the dream at night. He was known as a very kind god. He smelled very good, but unfortunately, he was also killed by Zeus because he raised the dead, and that, that wasn't uh, how it's supposed to be. And he had many epithets like physician, medicus, soter, and all these epithets are being transferred to Jesus also, which we see in literature again. His cult lasted on till the sixth century AD. And I think all these gods have many influences on Jesus as we know him today and we'll celebrate him and remember him next week when we have Christmas. So some conclusions. First, we have seen that Christmas is a very dynamic ritual due to its very detailed Christianization process. If we ignore for a moment the theological discussions about his nature as God or human or both, then we could argue that he's technically a demigod. He died and was deified just like Asclepius and Dionysus and Osiris, which makes him a rising and dying god. He could heal like Asclepius and even took, a, took over his appearance with like the beard and wearing the himation, as we see on the relief uh, below where he sits on a throne. And if we didn't know better, we thought uh, that, was, that was Asclepius. He gives light as a sun god, a light, light god like Mithras and, of course, Sol Invictus. He was portrayed as a sun Christ, as we have seen before. And he is also being described all the time as the best and the invincible, um, which makes him better than all the other gods. His cult offered blood as a ritual element, which was seen by other gods, which was taken over. And, of course, wine was the... The, 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 fl the fluid which symbolized the blood of Christ, just like with Dionysus. And finally, he was worshipped as a miracle man, a physician, and a doctor, and the savior of the whole world, which epithets we saw already with Asclepius. So in the end, Christ is being viewed as a mosaic figure, and I think this image of Christ uh, as mosaic is very uh, applicable to this lecture, because all the stones symbolize all the influences we have. In closing, I just want to point out a very funny rece reception of Christ, uh, which I saw in the movie uh, Dogma, where uh, the Cardinal is trying to convince people to come to this new religion called Catholicism. Wow, with the body Christ. And you see, of course, the heart with the sun radiance in the middle, and he's portray being portrayed as a very nice guy who is modern and uh, very, uh, very good uh, uh, character to do uh, worship. So, of course, next week we'll have Christmas. So, for now, I wish everyone already a, a Merry Christmas. And with the closing of the used bibliography, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, dear Mark, uh, for this insightful presentation. Uh, you just uh, made clear that uh, all these traditions that accompany uh, Jesus Christ face uh, were adapted to uh, previous uh, ancient rituals and practices. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, so now let's uh, move on to Professor Vania Lozanova. Let me just say a few things about uh, Vania. Vania Lozanova is a professor at the, at the Institute for Balkan Studies and Center of Psychology at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and at the St. Clement uh, Orhridixi or, or University of Sofia. Uh, her, research, uh, her research interests are focused on the history and theory of ancient religion and culture, ancient receptions in medieval and re renaissance culture, ancient texts in medieval context, history and theory, theory of theater, and uh, cultural and uh, historical heritage and tourism. Uh, today, she will uh, 
give us a lecture about Constantine and Christmas, more counter -argu arguments. Okay, so Vanya, we're looking forward to hearing you. Hi, colleagues. I'm very happy to be with you and to share my ideas about Constantine and uh, his uh, relations with uh, Christmas. Uh, do you see my presentation? Uh, no, not now. No, we see a gray screen, the YouTube. Yeah. Maybe if you turn on your video. Okay, yeah, now we see it. So, it's good? Yeah, 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 we see it perfectly. Okay. The birth and childhood of Jesus Christ were not the focus of the biblical text, and especially in the canonized New Testament interpretations of his life. This circumstance would be explained by the contradictory notion about uh, his nature and the circumstances of his nativity and reincarnation, which will escalate in the Aryan controversy and uh, Christ Christological disputes. It is no coincidence that the introduction of Christmas in Constantinople uh, coincides chronologically with the rejection of late Arianism as the dominant Christian doctrinal movement. For a long time, it was widely believed that at first, Christmas was invented by the Roman Emperor Constantine in 312 AD after the Battle of Milvian Bridge when he eventually converted to Christianity. Constantine the Great convened the first council of Nicaea in uh, 325, which adopted the Nicene Creed to decide upon the official day for Christmas on December 25th. I would like to say immediately that there is no evidence to support the claim that the day for Christmas was decided or even discussed at the Council of Nicaea. The third statement, the Christmas nativity on December 25th was the day of Natalis Solis Invicti, the festival of the birth of the invisible sun proclaimed by Roman Emperor Aurelian in the year 274 when solstice fell on this day. In AD 321, Constantine, because he had instituted the day of sun as a legal holiday, had instituted the December 25th as nativity fest of Christ as the one true son. All these statements fall within the context of arguing for Constantine eventual eventual early adoption of the Christian faith in the presumption that all his behavior is subordinated to his biases towards Christianity, which he seeks to impose in the empire. Constantinople was built with the intention of being a Christian city and the new Christian capital, new Rome of the empire. I would like to say again immediately that the formula New Rome appeared and was adopted only at the Ecumenical Council in Constantinople in 381 with the non free. The solar statue of Emperor Constantine, erected at the newly constructed Forum Constantine in Byzantium, on the famous Porphyry Column the day before or on the first day of the 40 day celebrations was associated with Jesus Christ as the son of righteousness. The counter arguments offered by me to all these hypotheses uh, and uh, especially to the hypothesis that the institutionalization and popularization of the Christmas holiday is tied to the personally personality of Emperor Constantine the Great can be systematized in the following few points. At first, 
according to any earlier event indicating the celebration of Christmas are dubious and are usually later interpolation and forgeries. The earliest recorded date for an annual fest day commemorating Jesus' birth on December 25th only in Rome can be found in the Positio Martyrum of the chrono, uh, chronography of uh, 354, which noted the earliest known Christmas celebration in 336 AD during the reign, reign of Constantine, but 11 years after the Council of Nicaea. More recently, the researchers of Thomas uh, Tully have argued his doubts about the possibility that Constantine had anything to do with the introduction of the celebration of Christmas in Rome. In Rome, the first celebration is attested for 336, when Constantine celebrated, but in Constantinople, his trip in Alia, unlike his last trip to the capital of the empire, in honor of his Vicenalia 10 years earlier, when he entered the city for the last time on July 18, 326, and leaves it at the end of September forever. Thomas Tully refutes, refutes uh, convincingly the statement that the emperor, because he had instituted the day of sun as a legal holiday in 321, had instituted December 25th as Nativity Fest of Christ as the one true son. The central argument to the hypothesis about Constantine's relation to Christmas is the Constantine decree of 321 restricting work on the day of the sun, Sunday, the first day of the Roman week, establishing it as a holiday and a day of prayer, an aspect of the worship of the solar deity and in possible association with the birth of Christ as the new son or his resurrection. This element falls within the context of the argumentation for the hypothetical early adoption of the Christian faith by Constantine, of which he gives no indication in all his behavior, especially around the consecration in inauguration of Byzantium. Constantine eventually issued two laws ordering all judges, townspeople, and artisans to rescue from the venerable day of the sun, venerabili die solis. However, the meager sources do not give any Christian tone to this legislation. This hypothesis has been refuted quite convincingly recently with a series of studies by Kelly McDonald Jr. The situation in Constantinople, however, is much more clear and unambiguous. The first problem arising from this situation is that the Christians at Rome were the only ones who eventually from 336 onwards, celebrated Christmas on December 25th. Constantine notoriously avoided Rome and consolidated his empire in the East, where Christians universally celebrated Christmas on January 6th. Formally speaking, from 324, victory over Licinius at Chrysopolis, until his death, Constantine resided nominally in Constantinople, but in fact in Nicomedia. There is no evidence that Christmas was celebrated in Constantinople until 380, as seen from the sermons of St. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople and St. Gregory of Nazianzen. According to tradition, the Christogena is uh, first mentioned in 376 by great Basileus of Caesarea. In the East, the first was established first in Antioch, 370, 
then in Constantinople, 380s, then in Asia Minor at the end of fourth century, and eventually Palestine. So not always without objection. In fact, in 386, St. John Chrysostom proposed that the Christian community could celebrate this day as the birth of Jesus Christ. This day took on another dimension when Emperor Justinian I made it a public holiday in 529 AD. But the date was not, not accepted in the Eastern Empire where January 6th had been favorite uh, and Christmas did not become a major Christian festival until the ninth century. St. Gregory's sermon delivered on the Fest of Light, January 6th, in uh, ID 381, is taken as an indication of the introduction of the Nativity in Constantinople. In this sermon, Gregory mentions the celebration of the Nativity on the previous December 25th, calling him, uh, himself Exorcus, that is, Institutor of the Fest. Thomas Tallis sees confirmation of this situation in John Chrysostom's mention in his uh, Christmas sermon preached in Antioch in 386 AD. At this day, <clears throat> for the Nativity, had been known in the region for less than 10 years. The next problem is caused by the attitude of Constantine the Great to Sol Invictus from 310 AD to circa 317 or 18 AD. Constantine used the image of Sol on his coins and claimed Sol as his divine protection which was skillfully integrated in the emperor propaganda machine. It should be noted, however, that since 317, the emperor's coins with images of that deity became ever rarer. rare. Around 319, it disappeared from Constantine's bronze coinage. And since 324 at last, if not earlier, Sol Invictus must have lost its former significance and no longer played a central role in Emperor Constantine's representation and ideology. Around 319, Sol Invictus disappears from Constantine bronze coinage, but not the emperor's worship to a sun god. It is very likely that Emperor Constantine I, the first moving away in his official religious policy from Sol Invictus, gradually replaced him with a more abstract and ambivalent solar god under the influence of solar monotheism and the solar ideas inherent in Neoplatonism under whose strong influence was he, according to the ancient sources, especially in the context of the consecra consecration of the newly founded by him city Constantinople. The iconography of the solar Constantine statue at the Forum Constantini gives rise to the next problem situation. The studies of the early scholars were dominated by the identification of the solar statues of the emperor with with uh, Sol Invictus or Helios, like Prager. But that does not square with the fact that Sol had completely disappeared from Constantine's coins at least a dozen years before the erection of the statue on in Byzantium. The diverging uh, accounts of the Byzantine authors leave no doubt that Constantine's statue on the Porphyry column on Forum Constantini stood far from the traditional iconographic schemes of Sol Invictus that the emperor seems to have abandoned in his other demonstration of his power considerably long before the inauguration of Constantinople 
in 330. A similar uh, conclusion is even more clearly suggested by the descriptions of the solar statue of Constantine holding he in his right hand, carried in the chariot of Helios during the celebration on the Hippodrome. There is no doubt that the forms of honoring the emperor statues and the images of Constantine, especially in the Jubilee medallions, not identified him with any deity. Jonathan Bardieu is even convinced that this is a demonstration of Constantine's divinity as present there, accepting the analogy of the games in honor of the founding of Rome with the consecration of Constantinople, he does not doubt that uh, uh, the emperor's behavior on the first day or on the previous day of the city celebrations demonstrate his claims to divinity and identification with a solar deity that was different from Sol Invictus. And may maybe from Helios. These suggestions can be detected in his propaganda already in the 310 AD Panegyric uh, that uh, characterized him as presentissimus his deus. All hypotheses are projected onto the insoluble question of the personal religious sympathies and predilection of Constantine the Great and his eventual attitude to Christian faith and doctrines. Essential indicators in the search for an answer to these questions are the events surrounding the concentration of Constantinople and the behavior of Constantine, especially the reminiscence of the religion political implications of the annual celebrations in the following centuries of the birthday, Genethlia, of the renewed, renewed city, among which stand out with their special significance two notable ritual and health centers, the Constantine Forum and Hippodrome. The debate about Constantine the Great's personal religious conv uh, convictions is all but insoluble. None of, this, uh, of his uh, contemporaries was able to puzzle out what exactly was hidden behind the uh, impenetrable mask of a statement. His overall behavior demonstrated rather an imperial pragmatism and political expediency. The most realistic explanation of his religious tolerance to Christianity is the interpretation suggested recently by a series of researchers that uh, the socio-religious and political circumstances preceding the battle of the Milvian Bridge uh, had caused a politically expedient change in Constantine's behavior for the purpose of imposing religious equality and achieving civil peace. Emperor's behavior did not demonstrate any personal intolerance to pagan deities. That public behavior was clearly reflected in the religious manifesta manifestation during the consecration of Constantinople. Another basic, basic misconception is that Constantinople had been founded as a purely Christian capital city. Contrary to Eusebius' claims, that Constantinople had been founded as a purely Christian capital city with only Christian churches, we have conspicuous evidence that Constantine tolerated local pagan, pagan cults and the city's religious traditions, skillfully avoiding confrontation with the members of different confessional communities, among which the Christian one was not dominant. We should also keep in mind that the city became a true ecclesiastical center as late as 451 AD, 120 years after its foundation, when by a decision of the Council of Chalcedon, the see of the Bishop of Constantinople 
became equal to the one of the Bishop of Rome, Canon 28. From this point of view, the de decision of the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, the third canon, were all, only a prelude to its turning into the Christian center of the Eastern Orthodox, uh, Orthodoxy. This is also the first thing that the idea of a new Rome is perceived in Constantinople as an eventual rival to the capital of the empire. Andre Pigagnol advances the now unprovable but quite plausible hypothesis that the Constantinople was founded to rather be a refu refuge for uh, philosophers. Pigagnol find a reason for such supposition in a passage by Porphyry from the later biography of his teacher, the, Plotino, uh, uh, the neo uh, Platonist Plotinus. Porphyry mention, mentions that Plotinus tried to convince Imperial Gallienus to rebuild a destroyed city in Campania, once called the city of philosophers, for the purposes of Plotinus philosophical school. The city's new citizens were to live there in accordance with the laws of Plato's ideal state, and the city itself was to be named Platonopolis. But like the case of the Neoplatonist father of Apamea, a follower of Porphyry, the intrigues of those envious of him in the imperial court put an end to his plans. Could it have been that Zopater tried to suggest a similar idea to Constantine? This is a big question. According to John Lidus' account, after the emperor himself, that prominent sophist and neo-Platonic philosopher, a disciple of Iamblichus, had also a central place in the consecration ceremony of Constantinople, playing the role of Telestes in a mystical ritual telesmata, together with Hierophant Pretextatus. Sosumenus in his Historia Ecclesiastica, Zosimus in Historia Nova, Evnapius of Sardi, uh, as well as the Suda Lepticon, point out the enormous influence that Sopater, but not the Christian of Labius, his enemy, had on Constantine. <clears throat> in that situation, it is important not to underestimate the emperor's effort to demonstrate universal religious tolerance and balance and concealing of personal religious philosophical bias. The tendencies noted in his coin minting and in his uh, royal court propaganda could be explained not so much with his possible new orientation to Christianity and with turning his back to paganism but rather with his effort to achieve a deliberate ambiguity and religious ambivalence with which Constantine tried to maintain balance in the religious state of the empire and the civil peace in it. In the whole behavior of the emperor during the consecration of Constantinople, there is not a hint or a trace of Christian uh, religious elements. There is no doubt that the forms of honoring the emperor's statues were foreign to any Christian context and suggested elements of pagan, mysterious uh, languages. That those were passes, passes over in silence by Eusebius, probably speak in brackets, most loudly, loudly of the fact. Unfortunately, there is no time to adduce all the facts and circumstances surrounding Constantine's religion political behavior in Constantinople. I hope in a future publication to be able to systematize most of the counter arguments briefly noted here. In conclusion, I would like to say again that we have neither direct nor indirect information and even a hint of any connection of Emperor Constantine I with the establishment of Christmas 
for nativity on December 25th, neither in Rome nor in Byzantium. And thank you to your attention. And of course, Merry Christmas. Thank you, dear Vanya. Uh, for this interesting uh, presentation, uh, which showed us uh, uh, the possible involvement of uh, Constantine the Great in Christmas or not, <laughs> you know. Uh, normally now we have a break scheduled, but uh, if you wish, we could move forward with uh, Mr. Gallagher's presentation. What do you say? Should we take a break or not? Maybe it's better to go on. Yeah, yeah, okay, and take later a break, okay. So let's move to Mr. Gallagher's presentation. Uh, let me say a few things about him. Uh, John Gallagher is a scholar of the medieval Bible with interest in uh, textual criticism, transmission, exegesis, literary adaption, and translation. Uh, John has taught widely in the fields of English, divinity, medieval studies, and comparative liter literature and also has a research interest in late antiquity, in particular the thought of Augustine of Hypo. Uh, today he will uh, present us uh, the uh, Christmas traditions in the early insular world. So John, the floor is yours. John, can you hear us? No, maybe we have some technical issues. Maybe the microphone. He's, he is muted. Yeah, so yeah he's muted. Yeah, he can't hear you. It might be that John thinks that we're going by the schedule and he's gone off to make a cup of tea or something. So uh, <laughs> it might be better to stick to the schedule. Okay, okay. So let's take a 15 minute uh, break, everyone, and uh, be back at 11.15 uh, of Athens time, yeah. Okay.
Are we all here? I think we missed Sergian. Uh, actually, Miss uh, Serjan uh, is in absentia. She cannot uh, be here with us oh. today. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's why we moved to Mr. Gallagher. But uh, it seems that uh, we have a connection problem with him. Okay, so let's move on uh, then to Mr. Mark Elliott. No, he is oh, here. Sorry, sorry. Oh, he's um, here. He's here. Okay. Sorry, it's, I have a very bad connection at the moment. Apologies. Okay, okay, yeah. great. Then I presented second. you a while ago before the break. So now, if you want, you can uh, present us your lecture. Sure. Um, I'm just having a bit of problem with my broadband at the moment, so I'm afraid that the um, audio might be a bit shaky. Uh, that's okay. We'll warn you. Okay. Um, so as we know um, for the speakers today, the forthcoming or this present colloquium is part of a two-part event the second of which will explore traditions around Roman and Byzantine Easter. Um, Easter is probably more synonymous with temporal debates about the structure and systematization of time and the computus, which is the medieval science of calendrical reckoning, particularly regarding Easter. However, Christmas, although it's a feast and not uh, a fixed feast and not a movable feast, is not all that straightforward. And there was a somewhat complicated dance by which Christmas landed at the date that we celebrate today. So the biblical texts have very little interest in precisely dating um, events, given the expectation of Christ's imminent return and the end of time. A century after the gospel texts um, were composed, we begin to see an interest in Christians trying to nail down dates for events mentioned in the biblical texts, such as the crucifixion and the birth of Christ. Clement of Alexandria reports various competing theories. Um, some thought that Christ became the son of God upon his baptism, um, and in the earliest stratum of Christianity, an event commemorating the manifestation or theophany of Christ began to be celebrated on the 6th of January in Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean world. So this event was not necessarily about the nativity, but rather the beginning of Christ's ministry as marked by his baptism by John the Baptist. This was thought to be based on um, either the Egyptian winter solstice or midwinter festival or a festival celebrating the Egyptian deity Eo, who was reborn um, but these theories have proven false, given that the Julian date of the 6th of January and the Egyptian equivalent do not necessarily match up. A competing Roman festival developed on the 25th of December. Notions that Christmas is based on the pagan festival of Sol Invictus, the winter solstice on the 25th of December, the Roman Saturnalia, which is um, from the 17th to the 23rd of December, or the Calends of January, which is the Roman Republican New Year, are mis misconceived or at least debatable. December means the 10th month um, in the old Roman New Year. Um, so, uh, in <clears throat> December means the 10th month as the old Roman New Year was um, on the Calends of March. So um, this is the same with the 6th of January as an Egyptian pagan festival. Um, and also the idea that the culture of the day, um, with its high regard for these agriculturally and astronomically yeah. important Roman feasts, had a soft influence on the selection of midwinter for one of the principal feasts of Christianity. This is also debatable. So Dies Natalis Sol Invicti is noted as occurring on the 25th of December in the chronography of 354. Um, this text is actually from a little bit earlier, despite, despite its name. Uh, and this is an important early Roman calendrical text or an almanac that contains one of the earliest lists <clears throat> of martyred believers and bishops. So at the beginning of the martyrological tract, the chronography also mentions that Christ was born on the 25th of December. So we've got two events in the chronography, the, um, the, the, the Sol Invictus 
and also the birth of Christ. And this is one of the earliest records we have for the Roman date of the 25th. So the transferred religious <clears throat> holiday or acculturation debate, what is called the history of religions hypothesis, where pagan feasts were deliberately supplanted by Christian ones, can be doubted regarding the Roman festival for several reasons. Firstly, Sol Invictus was only um, instituted in AD 274, meaning that it was hardly time for it to become firmly rooted before the time of Constantine. Secondly, and more importantly, the Christian church in this early period would have sought to distance herself quite strongly from pagan practices, especially following the peace of the church under Constantine in 313. Things change later, as we'll see with um, Gregory the Great's instruction instructions to Augustine of Canterbury regarding and um, the conversion of the English and the recycling of good pagan customs into Christian ones. Um, thirdly, the sun was not really an important god or deity in the Roman pantheon, but with the figure Luna was a symbolic personification of a cosmic body. And fourthly, the sun was commemorated on other days in the pagan Roman calendar. Thus, it seems unlikely that the 25th was chosen to compete with Sol Invictus or the Midwinter Roman Festival, although these might have been familiar to Roman Christians at this time. So Christmas originated in the West, almost certainly in Rome, by the late 3rd or early 4th century commemorating the Nativity. Outside of Rome, the 6th of January was variously celebrated by Christians as a commemoration of Christ's Nativity, his baptism in the Jordan, and the visitation of the Magi, Persian scientists who were the first Gentiles to acknowledge the Christ. The Church of the Greek East, Cappadocia, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Palestine, and Syria commemorated the birth of Christ on the 6th of January. Um, so the Nativity came to be associated with the Feast of the Manifestation. Um, gradually, however, the Roman date of the 25th of December gained precedence and took over in the Greek world from the 6th of January, which became primarily associated with the Epiphany, the Manifestation to the Gentiles. So we get interesting combinations of feasts on the same date, um, which can be found throughout the Roman Empire, East and West, um, except in North Africa, where the Donatists didn't celebrate Christmas. Um, so in Northern Italy and Gaul, we get the baptism and the visitation of the Magi uh, were combined with the ma marriage feast of Cana. Um, it's unclear if it was the uh, baptismal or the nativity theme that was the original subject um, <clears throat> for the 6th of January, but the Magi became, later came to be strongly connected with this date. It seems that the two feasts were commemorated then, birth and baptism, and it's the Roman feast of the birth that won out um, over the Eastern um, practice. So the 6th of January then came to be associated with a number of Marian and Dominical feasts, so Dominical pertaining to the Lord, including the visitation of the Magi, the purification of the Virgin, the baptism and the circumcision of Christ. Um, <clears throat> so back to the date of the 25th of December, an important theory for the origin of the 25th of December beyond the history of religions hypothesis is called the calculation or computation hypothesis. So the 25th of March is thought to be the date of numerous biblical events, including the first real date of ordinary time after the hexameron, the period of creation had ended. Um, it's also noted in certain mar uh, medieval martyrological texts as the date of the flood, and the date of the Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel to the Blessed Virgin, the sacrifice of Isaac, and the crucifixion. So in the Old English Martyrology, um, which I hope you have um, will have received the handout um, that was circulated, in the Old English Martyrology, the 25th of March is an important day. It follows the seventh day of creation. So the 24th of March um, is the day of both the Annunciation and the crucifixion. And in Aska Augustinian eschatological terms, the 25th of March mirrors the eighth day of creation, the anticipated end um, of time and the beginning of the world to come, um, following the seventh eschatological millennium of peace described in Revelation before the final consummation of time when heaven and earth are finally joined. So as such, this, there's an eschatological shade to the 25th of March that's later realized in um, the period of Advent and Christmas. In early Christianity, there was an idea that the Annunciation and the Nativity occurred on the same day, but this theory didn't hold water, so it fell out of um, currency. The real origin of Roman Christmas, in my view, is that um, the 25th of December is nine months on from the Annunciation. So this is um, basically the, the, the computation hypothesis, where we count nine months from the 25th of March forward to the 25th of December. So the origin of the 25th of March for these biblical events is complicated and beyond the scope of the present paper, but I hope to kind of get into some of these details in, in the written up version of, of this um, lecture. But in essence, it comes down to calculations around the first Easter, the creation of the luminary 
is on the fourth day of the Hexameron firmly roots the days of creation in the calendar, and thus the days of creation were understood as preceding the 25th of March. So there's a prominent characteristic um, in er, patristic and early me medieval theological thought, um, this attempt to draw typological connections um, between, for example, the sacrifice of Isaac and the crucifixion as occurring on the same day. So symmetry is really important, um, which we also see um, in medieval um, texts, the literary texts that deal with Christmas, um, such as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. That, that's a, a medieval English text that's very much about symmetry. Um, so moving on to, to, to the handout, in the Old English Martyrology, the text opens on the 25th of December, the Nativity of the Lord, which is the start of the liturgical year in the early medieval world. So in the Old English Martyrology, it's quite interesting because we also get the 1st of January as the first of the year. So in this way, it's bicultural. We get the, the, the two starts to the, to, to the year. We have the start of the liturgical year and the start of the Roman secular year. So today, the liturgical calendar starts on Advent Sunday or Advent 1. Um, Christmas is placed above all other feasts um, that occur on this date in the Old English Martyrology, essentially grading these feasts in terms of their liturgical importance. Interestingly, Christmas gets a sort of hagiographical treatment in the martyrologist's reference to the miracles that occurred in Rome, the signs, importance, and anecdote about the Christ child's bathwater. These are analyst and analytic or um, homiletic in origin, according to Christine Rauer. Signs and portents of death are given in Matthew 27, which are kind of reflected here, in, but in terms of the birth of Christ. The orientation of the martyrologist towards Rome as his liturgical center, something that the Irish didn't always agree with, is evident in the story about the ox in Rome. Um, so in this account, it's Rome that responds um, to the birth of Christ and Rome where, where miracles occur. Um, on the 1st of January, the circumcision of Christ and the purification of the Virgin is introduced by the martyrologist as the octave of Christ and St. Mary. So the octave of the Lord is the title found in most older sacramental, sacramentary texts. Um, but the circumcision was nevertheless a known liturgical feast at this time and is attested from the 8th century continental um, Galatian sacramentary. The martyrologist's entry for the 1st of January also includes the circumcision and the naming of Christ. However, in this text, it's the octave of Christmas, an octave being a se secondary festival that's placed one week after a major festival that outranks the relatively new, although established, dominical feast of the circumcision. So the Feast of the Circumcision was widely celebrated um, by the time of the 10th century when Alfred of Ancient composed a homily for the occasion. So the importance of Christmas as one of the primary feasts of the liturgical and Christian year is reflected in the martyrologist's treatment of the 1st of January, which is introduced first and foremost as an octave of Christmas, despite apparent knowledge of the circumcision. The title, the octave of Christ and St. Mary, might seem odd to the modern eye. However, the 1st of January was celebrated as Na uh, Natale Sancti Mariae from the earliest, uh, from the 7th century onwards in Rome, which is one of the earliest Marian feasts to be universally mandated. Feasts were not regulated in, um, in as such in, in the medieval world. Um, although later placed, um, displaced by other Marian feasts, the martyrologist hearkens to this joint feast celebrating both the birth of Christ and honoring the Virgin, a dual appreciation of some antiquity, much like the Annunciation, which is both Marian and Dominical. The martyrologist's reference to purification seems to relate to the fact that both um, the um, circumcision of Christ and the purification of the Virgin constituted a joint feast before the latter came to be celebrated on the 2nd of February. So interestingly, the Old English martyrologist educates its reader, um, their reader, about liturgical history and the scale of importance for liturgical feasts in the local and universal liturgical and seasonal year. The martyrologist tells us that the Feast of All Saints, very interestingly, the 1st of November, which was instituted by Pope Boniface, was also decreed um, to be celebrated and afforded the same importance as Christmas. So this is the only um, feast that seems to, to, to compete in the martyrology with, with, with the Feast of Christmas, although Easter is um, also thought to be the most important um, feast in the year. So moving on to um, a further text, um, the Old English um, metrical calendar, um, which resembles similar hexametrical Anglo-Latin metrical calendars, um, such as the calendar of Hampton and York. This provides an outline of the liturgical year in poetry. So the information in these um, texts are not necessarily so unique, but they give us um, details such as the historical name of the month, uh, Hluda, and informs us about uh, Anglo-Saxon Romanitas, or Roman liturgical identity that's so strongly linked to Gregory the Great, especially regarding big feasts like Christmas. 
So um, just to, for context in terms of the medieval world, um, some historical associations of the Feast of Christmas. Christmas is highly important um, and one of the most holy days of the year, surpassed only by Easter. It's the date chosen for coronations, such as that of Charlemagne, on the evening of Christmas Day in the year 800. Um, also, William the Conqueror was also crowned on Christmas Day. Edward the Confessor, based on continental practices, introduced Christmas courts and councils accompanied by religious ceremonies and formal processions and crown wearings at major ecclesiastical feasts such as Christmas and Easter. So the regal associations of the birth of Basilius Basilion, the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace on this day, invited this kind of political dimension to, to the feast in the medieval world. The court at Camelot and the Christmas games of Sir Gawain reflect the custom in a much later period. Kings travel to palaces and major urban centres at Christmas time. And the fasting scene from the old Icelandic saga, Brennu Nav, um, recounts the rollicking celebrations held by Sigtrir, the Hiberno Norse King of Dublin. So there's also an archaeopiscopal custom um, around Christmas as well, where the primates of England's two ecclesiastical provinces, Canterbury and York, um, would wear their pallium, a sort of um, archaeopiscopal stole or scarf. Um, this would be worn at both Christmas and Easter. Although theologically Easter is more significant in terms of salvation, it does not have the same cultural importance as Christmas. In medieval Ireland, Christmas was not as big as Easter, but it was still a very special time. In a particularly uh, interesting early Irish chant for the first hour of Christmas Day, there's no mention of the birth of Christ. The antiphon instead focuses on the monks being overjoyed at the prospect of waxing daylights, something that anyone who's lived in the northern reaches of Europe can appreciate. Um, in the Navigatio Sancti Brandani Abatis, the voyage of St. Brendan the Navigator, one of Ireland's so-called Twelve Apostles, Brendan and his coterie come across a series of mystical islands and creatures. They arrive on the mystical isle of St. Alba, named for Ireland's principal pre-patrician saint, um, St. Alba. So Alba is a community and an island um, that's mythical um, and magical that exists solely to praise God through the recitation of chants, the divine office, and the liturgy of the mass. The island grants its inhabitants immortality and sustenance. Um, manna is provided unendingly by Christ for the monks that dwell there. The, um, so Brendan and his group arrive at the start of Advent and remain for the entirety of the Christmas season, showing that this was a particularly special time devotionally. Um, the fantastical medieval bestseller, um, this Navigatio text, actually gives us in insight into the solemnity with which the season of preparation was observed amongst the Irish. So upon arrival on the island, Brendan um, instructs the monks to observe a strict silence which they maintain for the duration. Needless to say, the abbot does not let Brendan and his entourage remain on the Isle of the Blessed. Um, it's curious, however, that the abbot, after telling Brendan that he cannot stay on the island, does not allow him to depart um, and that he must remain there for the entirety of Advent and Christmas. So Advent and Christmas anticipate the gift of Christ to the world, which is fully realized in terms of salvation at Easter. It's a celebration of that bounty that demands pause and solemnity, but also joy and a break from difficult labor. Again, we see an eschatological shade to this narrative about solemnity, unceasing prayer and immortality. St. Brendan's Christmas is an uh, anticipation of the Vita Angelica of the world to come. The eschatological um, anticipation is figured in the silent community where Brendan will wait in anticipation of Christ's incarnation to the world while completely dependent upon God's bounty. Um, so a really bizarre treatise on liturgical practice survives in Alfred's letter to the monks at Ancham. This is a long and complicated text that I haven't really got to work with um, very much in depth in, in, until now, uh, but I hope to um, to delve into more detail um, in, in the written up version of this paper on, on Alfred's letter to the monks. Uh, it contains a really bizarre set of instructions um, dictating um, practices around food and drink uh, when the monks could have a fire and a series of strange and somewhat idiosyncratic liturgical customs. So um, I'm going to hopefully delve into, into that text, but it's been included on the handout and um, I, I have, I'd have i be very grateful if anybody has any, any thoughts on that particular text. Um, so re re Christmas requires celebration, but Advent is arguably the most important and spiritually beneficial aspect of the season. It's a penitential season first and foremost like Lent. Um, this is made clear in the Old English poem, The Seasons for Fasting a liturgical homiletic poem discovered in transcription in 1934 amongst the papers of the antiquarian Lawrence Knoll. This is not um, a text of great literary merit, it must be admitted. I actually helped um, edit this text for the Consolidated Library of Anglo-Saxon Poetry 
um, project at Oxford, which was rather tedious, but it is nonetheless a valuable um, text as it informs us about liturgical practices at this time. Friday is already a day of abstinence, so the importance is placed in this text on Thursday, Saturday and Sunday in the week preceding Christmas. The emphasis on Gregory the Great interestingly illustrates continuing attachment to the English custom, um, custom of Romanitas or Romanness, a point of pride at this time before universal legalistic standardization um, was instituted compared to the more idiosyncratic liturgical practices of the Celtic nations. Fasting is the medieval response to sacred moments, and Advent is one of these sacred moments in the cycle of the church year. The penitential aspect is somewhat lost today uh, when the celebratory aspect of Christmas enjoys a prelude from as early as Halloween or All Saints. At Easter, we prepare ourselves to benefit from the salvific work of Calvary. At Christmas, however, to the late antique and medieval Christian mind, the Lord condescended to human flesh, the celebration of which takes on an eschatological color as an anticipation of the return of Christ and the eschaton, the final judgment of mankind, the establishment of the kingdom on earth, and the later final consummation of human time and the eternal banquet of heaven. The Advent lyrics, the precursor of the old the O antiphons used in the modern liturgy, emphasize this eschatological theme. In the early insular world, Advent would have been a much more apocalyptically charged season than what we might think of today. Advent is a corporate pilgrimage to encounter Christ in his birth and his second coming. When the Apostle Paul describes the disciples being caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord when Christ returns in 1 Thessalonians, he's thinking it would be like going on a pilgrimage with fellow citizens to greet a royal delegation outside the city and to journey back with that no noble person. In the early insular Advent, preparation for Christ's birth, there's a hopeful um, anticipation also of his glorious second return, the yearning of the Psalms for consolation and the anticipation of Simeon and, and the Nunc Dimittis is what undergirds, these are the ideas that undergird the medieval Christian season. Uh, in this thought system uh, in the early insular world, Advent and Christmas are essentially an eschatological exercise in opening oneself up to God and celebrating that arrival. Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear John, for this beautiful uh, lecture. Uh, we learned uh, very uh, many things. Uh, and uh, now I think it's time to move on. Actually, there's no reason to take another break, I think. So let's move to our next uh, speaker for uh, today, Mr. Mark Elliott. Uh, let me say a few things about Mark. Uh, Mark Elliott was schooled in Glasgow. For university, he went to, lead, to read the law at Oxford, and then he studied divinity at Aberdeen and gained his uh, PhD in patristics at Cambridge University. He then taught at the universities of Nottingham, Liverpool, Hope, and St. Andrews, then Glasgow University, and now the University of the Highland and Iceland and Islands, where he is professor of biblical and historical theology. His uh, recent projects include the history of Scottish theology and uh, providence, biblical and theological with uh, Baker and Psalms, 42 to 72. He was called chair of the history of interpretation section at the annual meeting of the Society for Biblical Literature and editor of the Moher Civic series, History of Biblical Exegesis. Uh, now he is going to move a little bit further from late antiquity and take us to the early modern world uh, with his presentation entitled Early Modern Protestant Resistance to Christmas. So Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Zoe, can you hear me okay? Yeah, 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 perfectly. Good, good. Okay, I'm just going to... Uh, su summarize a paper, um, which is already a summary, but uh, hopefully We'll learn something. It won't be too depressing. It will be, in some sense, affirming Christmas. I don't want to say that the Protestant resistance to Christmas means necessarily uh, an objection to, to the incarnation. It's more a resistance to the things, the practice of Christmas that they had some problems with. Okay. Well, it's well known that Martin Luther was the one who uh, kind of put Christmas back on the, on the map in the sense that he uh, allowed people or encouraged people to find a Christmas tree and to, to decorate it, and that he also said that we should give each other presents on December the 24th, not on December the 6th, and therefore he stole something from St. Nicholas, 
and gave it to Christ just in the way that the Protestant Reformation saw itself as removing honor from the saints in some ways and giving honor to, uh, to, to Christ or moving honor from the church and giving it to Christ. So um, this, of course, is the Lutheran thing, but the reform that I'm particularly talking about, the Swiss Reformation, the Dutch Reformation, the Scottish Reformation, um, they uh, they were somewhat a little bit suspicious of this enthusiasm for Christmas. There's a, 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 there's a preacher at Strasbourg in the late 1630s called uh, Danhauer, um, who mentions the practice of these uh, decorating Christmas trees and all this kind of thing. And it's just about acceptable, he thinks, but only just acceptable. Uh, the Lutherans do it. Um, we can certainly see, therefore, that the Lutherans had a, had a positive spirituality of Christmas. One only has to think of Bach's Weihnachts Oratorium. Um, but uh, for the Reformed, so not the Lutherans, but the Reformed, less positive, where they want to be slightly careful, and they think that the a real true theological emphasis will want to stress the invisibility, the invisibility of God's providence in Christ's mission, rather than some kind of visibility, which always, always should be kind of reproduced in some ways and brought into the present. So uh, if you think of Rembrandt's nativity, sees not that Rembrandt is necessarily a, a representative of Dutch Calvinism. Um, but the, his nativity sins are very much of a dark barn, a very ordinary kind of looking place, nothing terribly spiritual or theological looking about it, an ordinary looking baby, it, quite often in a spotlight. Second factor, perhaps, in the kind of sobriety, uh, so I, I've mentioned that the, the Reformed don't particularly uh, like things that are visible, and so therefore don't like... Uh, reproducing kind of sacred scenes. But the second factor, I think, is that the, the Bible simply doesn't really seem to mention that one should celebrate Christmas. It does mention the first Christmas and the, the accounts of by Matthew and Luke, but it does not say that one should celebrate Christmas. So if it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us to do it, we shouldn't do it. This is a well-known sort of Puritan principle. Um, and, and what's more important is that the Bible tells us to keep the Sabbath day and so if we keep the Sabbath day, we don't need to keep any feast during the year. If every if every Sunday, 52 Sundays of the year uh, are to be celebrated specially, then there's no time or space left for all these other holy days. And Christmas is one of those holy days. Thirdly, and perhaps this goes to the root of the thing, is again, is the practice of Christmas, what it had become. This long 12-day holiday of Christmas time offered just too much time for partying. During the reign of James I, those at the royal court were meant to go back to their own country states and use that time for sober reflection. But really, in the end, what they did was what they liked to do. And Shakespeare's Twelfth Night witnesses to the fact that there's a tension between those um, in the early, late, 15, late 16th century, early 17th century who want to be sober, like the Puritans, and those who don't want to be sober at all during Christmas. And so therefore, in even in Puritan New England, moving on a couple of decades, the father and son, uh, Increase Mather and Cotton Mather, lamented the dissolution that went on at Christmas, drunkenness, uh, debauchery, all sorts of things. Um, and in 1620, the governor of Massachusetts, William Bradford, insisted that the 25th of December should be a working day, just like any other day, not a day off for parties. And therefore, um, however, there was a number of Anglicans uh, in that colony, and they refused to work on Christmas. And that sparked a disagreement with Governor Bradford, who insisted that, okay, even if they took the day off, they were not allowed to have lots of drunken parties. So by 1659, it was forbidden in Massachusetts to celebrate Christmas with feasting, um, or even to take the day off, off work. So that was an eventually uh, clamped down on. And I'm getting that from the essay in the uh, Oxford Handbook to Christmas, um, edited by Tim Larson, is the, the essay by Katrina Wheeler. So, um, but prior to that, even in England, um, and this is a guy called William Prynne in the 1630s, who objects to the practice that he sees all around him. He says, when our saviour was born back, you know, all those years ago, we don't hear of people celebrating by feasting, drinking, roaring, carding, dicing, stage plays, mummeries, masks, or heathenish Christmas pastimes. 
what we had were precious puritanical angels, saints and shepherds. Um, so all this kind of thing, where he sees that the work of the devil at the Christmas has become, uh, for his troubles, Prynne was fined £5,000, imprisoned, had his ears clipped, and was branded on the cheeks for his seditious libels. So a great, this is, becomes a very hot topic in the culture wars of the 1630s and into 1640s. Civil war breaks out around these kinds of things. But let's get to Scotland. I want to focus on Scotland for, for the last part of the, of the paper. And that is the situation in the Kirk or the Church of Scotland when it published its first book of discipline in the, during the Reformation in 1561. Um, it had this to say about Christmas. Christmas was one of the many holy days commanded by man, by human beings. Our were such as the Papists, the Roman Catholic Church, have invented in God's scripture, there's, neither a com there's no commandment nor assurance, and we should judge them to be abolished from this realm. So that they ruled, the church ruled with the parliament behind them in 1561, that there was going to be no place for these feasts and Christmas partic in particular. This was confirmed when the church welcomed the Second Helvetic Confession, borrowed from Switzerland in 1566, but made some edits. And those edits made sure that there was to be no religious observance of any events connected with the life of Christ, including his birth. An active campaign of suppression by the church took place in the 1570s. In 1573, um, Aberdeen Kirk Session put on trial 14 women for playing, dancing and singing of filthy carols on the Yule Day on Christmas Day at uh, the evening time. So, uh, and the Glasgow Kirk Session had a similar thing in 1583 to excommunicate and have the secular magistrates punish those who kept Christmas as a feast. So that in itself is, I, I think, is, shows you kind of the, the, the rather negative approach to the practice of Christmas as they had received it uh, in that sort of late medieval form. Uh, there were complaints that Christmas was a, just an occasion where filthy minds and mouths, fleshly livers, could set forth to triumph against the most sound and best, most reformed professors and to rejoice in their rotten opinions, a, sens a, a opportunity for sensual observation, gluttony, and guising, so uh, dram dramatic performance and that kind of thing. So there were penalties in post-Reformation Scotland at this time in the 1580s for not working on Christmas Day, <laughs> for taking the day off. So um, this, we know of a, a, one obstinate a stonemason called James Thompson, who was bound over to labour on that day. And, you know, if he couldn't find any work, it was decreed that he should make something useful with his hands on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. um, the historian Margot Todd tells us about William Cooper, um, a minister of Perth who was made a, a bishop by King James VI and I, but even then he was still very strict in his opposition to the Christmas feast from 1612 in Galloway. Quote, his standards were, were strict. Um, this is a quote from, the, uh, by, from Margot Todd herself. Um, Cooper's standards were strict. Even his own colleague John Malcolm thought his efforts to quash Christmas to be excessive. Cooper, it seems, as a bishop, would pop unannounced into people's kitchens on Christmas Day to discover whether they had a goose in the oven. And if they did, off they went to the session, the cooks at the church uh, court for punishment. To dig down to one particular example that I am familiar with, John Sharp was a theologian formed by the Reformed New College at the University of St. Andrews in the late uh, 1500s. I was minister at Kilmeny in Fife until 1607 when he was exiled um, for opposing the royal commissioners and opposing the king who claimed a right to call the General Assembly of the church and made some ministers in the Church of Scotland resisted this and said it wasn't the king's business or his commissioners to call a General Assembly of the church. Sharp therefore had to go to France and found a position uh, in the Dauphiny region of southeast France in probably the smallest and least fashionable of the Huguenot academies. Um, I won't go into the details of his time there, uh, just to say it wasn't necessarily a particularly happy time. He kept wanting to come back and didn't want to manage to persuade King James to change his mind, however. But 
we we realized that uh, that he didn't soften his position on a number of things. And um, one of the works that he wrote was in 1625, when he was still in France before he eventually managed to get back to Scotland. And he does he goes through various questions in this work, the, the Symphony of the Prophets and the Apostles, published in Geneva in 1625. Where John Sharp, this person that I'm looking at, exiled in France, um, has these various questions on the Bible. And the, one of the questions that comes up to question number six on the New Testament, <clears throat> so quite quickly, as you can imagine, as he's discussing the nativity, stories of Matthew, he says, in which year, in what year was Christ born? Um, so what time of year was Christ born? Well, the papers say, the papers being the Roman Catholics that he's opposing, the winter solstice. And they tried to argue that Zechariah was the high priest and that John the Baptist was conceived on the 10th day of the seventh month. This Zechariah being the high priest is very important because if he's the high priest, then this is what, what has been described in the temple in the very early uh, early verses here of, of Luke, and it's quite interesting, he, he switches to Luke at this point, Luke 1.7, is talking about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And we know when that is, and therefore we can we can say that, that Zechariah um, was doing this at this time, and then John the Baptist was conceived, and then you work out from there when Jesus was conceived. Um, and therefore, when then Jesus was born. So you can work it all out by, by realizing that Zechariah is the high priest working on the Day of Atonement in Luke chapter 1, verse 7. But Sharps objects to this and says, actually, that's nonsense. Zechariah is not the high priest. He's just a priest. If he'd been a high priest, it would have said high priest. But it doesn't say high priest. It just says he's a priest. This is not the Day of Atonement. All Zechariah was doing was doing his weekly shift. It was kind of ordinary time for, for, for priests, as it were. And it seems to be that Zechariah, if when this incident happened, when the angel appeared to him, was actually at the end of July. And I think he seems to be basing this on some calculation that had been done with the help of Josephus, reading Josephus by um, by by Johann Scaliger, uh, who is the the great uh, humanist who, who was interested in these things just a, a decade or so before. So. Um, Christ could not have been born in the winter solstice because Zechariah is and, and, and John the Baptist's um, conception are taking place sometime in the summer. It's much better to think uh, that Jesus was probably born um, sometime in, in late spring, early summer, um, when the shepherds would have been quite happy to be outside with their flocks. So of course, he thinks that the shepherds being outside, you know, would be like if you had it at Christmas time, that would have been terrible. But, you know, not really thinking that maybe in Palestine that wouldn't have been so bad as having shepherds outside in Scotland or in France. Um, but never mind. Um, but also, I think this is more important for Sharp. Jesus' birthday probably has to be in the spring and the summer because the moment Jesus reached 30, the very moment he reached 30 was when he started his ministry. And when he starts his ministry, he encounters John the Baptist in the desert. And this is taking place in the context of people going out into the desert at a, at a, at a spring moment in spring. And Jesus, the moment he's 30, goes to, goes to join that. So he was 30 years old in the spring. His birthday is in the spring. He was born in the spring. So it's not terribly precise, but you could see nothing as precise as these people who really knew how to, to do computation. But there's a lot of this go, going on uh, in Protestant circles in order to show that Christmas, the truth of the matter is that Christmas does not coincide with December 25th and has nothing to do with the winter solstice um, and has nothing to do with the reappearance of light and all these somewhat pagan pagan things. So the whole point of Sharp's work is to try to confound um, the Catholics who are don't read scripture properly, are not careful enough, and who, who are prejudiced already by their practices and their church traditions. So um, this is an example, I think, that I've come across of somebody who wants to kind of undermine the very reason for the season in the, in, in the Catholic calendar, um, rather than actually trying to say something more positive about Christmas. But that's not to say, of course, that Protestantism hasn't got positive things to say about Christmas. But you, there is always a sense that Protestantism always wants to say that, first of all, the historic, getting your history right from the Bible is very important, even if that actually disappoints you and means that you can't uh, have a Christmas uh, on, on the 25th of December. But secondly, it's also important that if we're going to talk about theological meaning, 
that what goes on in the in the individual heart is more important than what goes on in the kind of collective church services and calendars and, and rituals. A case in point is somebody like Schleimacher, um, who uh, Kate Sonderegger in that Oxford Handbook Christmas uh, writes a quite a thoughtful chapter. And she's rather critical of Schleiermacher, but Schleiermacher nonetheless does have something rather Protestant about his approach to Christmas, where it's not so much about the, the, the when of Christmas or even how we celebrate Christmas as to, together, but the point of Christmas is that Jesus Christ, as an infant, has come to symbolize and express the nostalgia and longing for a love undiluted and a dependency undefiled by disappointment and betrayal, and betrayal. The infant Christ is a symbol of love and even more of innocence. Unlike the royal child of much medieval sculpture, this child Jesus is fully infant-like, rounded and open-armed, soft and vulnerable. He's become something universal, a child in love and in need of the and, and the delight of his adoring mother. So it's the relationship between the mother and the child are very central here between Mary and Jesus, that relationship of dependency <clears throat> and that relationship of, of, of mutual love and trust. And Christ, therefore, Jesus Christ becomes a symbol. He becomes a symbol of the, the, the person who is open to love, the person who is open to trust. And so we're not looking at Jesus to kind of get an idea of one particular Jewish life at a certain moment in time. But we start to discover Jesus in all innocent children in the eyes of the, ch the child who has a, a wonder, who, who accepts the wonder of Christmas, for example. And so therefore, um, this allows a certain amount of universality. So as Kate Sonderegger puts it in her comments on this, she says, the love that is born at Christmas may take the form and appearance of an Asian child. It may come to expression as a member of a Dinka family. It may belong in an Inuit home. Because Christ is every child, and his universality can be measured by his hiddenness within the childhood of the whole human family. And Sondra then says rather critically of this, of this kind of trend, as in all representative Christologies, a subtle inversion can threaten this welcome note of universality. Is it exactly that Jesus Christ is present as holy child within every human child? Or is it perhaps that every human child lives out what Jesus too assumes at birth? Or to use Christina Rossetti's idiom for the moment, is it quite that Jesus Christ is love who descends at Christmas? Or is it love that Jesus Christ also is? So the, she talks about the reversal of the subject of the predicate. But the predicate love, innocence, has kind of swallowed up the subject, Jesus Christ himself. And we are already, you know, tempted to redefine Jesus in the cat according to the categories of our own. This is a great sort of Protestant heresy, shall we say, which the individualizing and the kind of emotionalizing of Christmas has, has led to. So um, we may want to think that with good Protestants that the answer to this, the antidote to this kind of trend, this kind of fashion is, uh, is Karl Barth and his theology, which talks about Christmas also being a sense in which judgment comes upon the earth because the, the Christ comes not simply to, to redeem the world, which he does, but he, he redeems through judging the world, through judging sin, through dealing with sin. Um, one could one could, could talk about that with inner, an inner present debates, but I won't bore you with those, with, with those details. Instead, just by way of conclusion, I will want to agree that I think we should believe in the divine otherness of Christ, that this is important to the Christian traditions, whether they be Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant, if rightly understood. And therefore, the divine otherness can be glimpsed in the kind of mysteriousness of sacred art. And that can allow us to go beyond the kind of the various assumptions that we bring to Christmas time as rather kind of jaded materialistic people. It might be that we are open to surprise by the reading of, say, John's Gospel's prologue, rather than the nativity scenes, the nativity stories that we that we hear from the other other gospels. And in this sense, the 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 iconic, the, the beautiful, the pictorial at Christmas can be a door to the sacred. So long as we remember there's a door, the door leads to something, that behind the door there is a reality to investigate. And so the early reformed insistence on the historicity of the particular uh stories of Christ just as to when this was or when it wasn't 
um, is important because for the Reformed, Christmas was tied to Easter as part of a special time in real history, a real history, historical moments. And sometimes that meant viewing the incarnation as a past event rather than as a timeless theological reality. It must be said, of course, that for Protestants, it was never less than a fully Chalcedonian Orthodox view of the, of the incarnation that they assumed, virgin conception, virgin birth included. But the Protestants, I think, if they believe it was anything properly, is a will to truth uh, behind the appearances of whatever we, we see at Christmas time. Uh, I'm guided by a certain sobriety, just like John was saying about the Irish monks, a certain quietness of spirit. Um, are, are wishing to peer more deeply into the to into in and through appearances. Thank you. We thank you, dear Mark, for this insightful uh, presentation. And we certainly learned uh, many things. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we move on to uh, Dr. Georgi Pap, uh, who is going to present us a lecture entitled The Incarnation of Jesus Christ in the Early Christian uh, Creeds. But first, let me say a few things about Georgi. Georgi Papp is a lecturer of arts and fancy to languages at the Protestant Theological Institute. Uh, his main field of interest covers various philological questions of the Bible and questions concerning the reception of biblical text in early Christianity. So we're looking forward to hearing uh, his presentation today. Georgi? Thank you very much. You can hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Yes, and uh, my screen is visible? Yes, yes. Okay. And thank you very much for uh, the possibility to present this short uh, presentation. It will be more theoretical because um, I will try to answer the question how does the motif of the incarnation appear in the early Christian creeds? What uh, did uh, think the church fathers when they, when they formulated uh, the first creeds and uh, before the creeds? I call them creed-like statements. Generally said, a creed is a formal or official statement of Christian beliefs and uh, we can expect from it to answer questions in debate and uh, to give a short summary about the essence of theological questions. And this means that a creed is born in a double context. The first context is the inter internal necessity of the church, that is, Creeds were formulated for catechumens uh, before baptism. And the other context is an apologetical context that a creed should defend the theological teaching. The roots of the creeds are reaching into the scripture and uh, what the creeds are saying about the incarnation which is one of the deepest mysteries of Christian theology. As a narrative, we can find them in the canonical and extra canonical gospels and their first interpretation are to be found in the gospels and the apostolic letters. In the post-biblical era, the apostolic fathers and the apologets have continued to develop the theology of incarnation and to tell it in philosophical terms. <clears throat> A regular creed has three parts. The first part is about the father and the creation. The second part is about the son and the salvation of human being. And the third part is about the Holy Spirit and the sanctification, or some other historical work says, is about the action of spirit. The passage on the incarnation is to be found in the first section of the second part. So 
the passage on incarnation has a place in the passage about the Son and the salvation. And this passage uh, can be divided into more subsections. I have um, pointed out three. What is um, present in every creed is the name of the Son and his epithetons. The second, the origin of the Son. And the third is uh, not in every creed, but in many creeds is present. The nature of the Son and the purpose of his sonship. In the next section, we will uh, take a look on the creed-like statements from the pre-creedal era. Thoughts uh, like uh, they appear in creeds can be found in the works of the Apostolic Fathers as well. First of all, I will uh, point out some thoughts of um, Ignatius of Antioch. In his letter to the, to the Ephesians chapter seven, we read, we have also as a physician, the Lord, our God, Jesus the Christ, the only begotten son and word before time began, but who afterwards became also man of Mary the Virgin. And later in chapter 20 of the same letter, he, he wrote, Jesus Christ, who was of the seed of David according to the flesh, being but the son of man and the son of God. And he repeats this uh, argument in his letter to, Sm to Smyrnaeus. He was truly of the seed of David according to flesh and the son of God according to the will and power of God. And that he was truly born of a virgin. And to Trellians in chapter nine, he writes about uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that he was descended from David and was also of Mary, and he was truly born and did eat and drink. He was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, and here he is going on uh, his passion. Okay. In the work of the apologists, we read uh, similar statements that uh, Jesus Christ is God and he came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin assumed and clothed himself with flesh. We read in, in Aristides Ap Apologies chapter two. And uh, the, son, the son of God lived in a daughter of man. This is a very plastical image of his incarnation. In Justin Martyr, we read that Jesus, our Christ, as foretold, is born of a virgin, growing up to man's estate and healing every disease and every sickness and raising the dead and being hated. And here quotes uh, the prophecy of Isaiah. And in the lost apology of Melito of Sardis, we read that this is he who was made flesh in a virgin, whose bones were not broken up on the tree, who in burial was not resolved, resolved into earth, and whether, and uh, again, is going forth on his passion and resurrection. In the works of um, Irenaeus, we read uh, more statements which are more, li more likely to the statements which are to be found in the early Christian creeds. In Adversus Heresis Book 3, we read, believing in one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and all things therein, by means believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who because of his surpassing love towards his creation, 
condescended to be born of the Virgin, he himself uniting man to himself to God. And uh, again, in the same work, the word of God, who is the savior of all and the ruler of heaven and earth, who is Jesus. And as I have already pointed out, who did also take upon him flesh and was anointed by the spirit from the father and was made Jesus Christ. And somewhat later, the son of God was born of a virgin and that he himself was Christ the savior whom the prophets had foretold. As these men assert that Jesus was he who was born of Mary, but that Christ was he who descended from above. And in, he, and in his epideixis, he has a very similar statement to the teaching of the creeds. We have received baptism for remission remission of sins in the name of God, the Father, and in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was incarnate and died and rose again and in the Holy Spirit of God. So we see that uh, with time, these creed-like creed -like statements are changed into uh, fi some fixed formulas. And in Tertullian, and sorry that here I have the text in Latin, we read more similar statements to those in the creeds. That Christ is um, descended from the heaven of the spirit of the Father, and in Mary, the Virgin, and is made flesh in his um, <clears throat> in her and uh, is born as Jesus Christ. And in uh, the Virginibus Velandis, he wrote that regula fidei, the rule of the faith, is to believe in the one God and in his son, Jesus Christ, who is born from Mary the Virgin. And in the same, same manner, we find in Origenes that Jesus Christ, who is come, who is coming before every creature, is born from the Father and is last times he is made man and incarnated he took up a body like our but the one difference was that he is born of a virgin and the holy spirit and in pseudo origenis so adamantius in the third or fourth century, we read that Jesus Christ took up the human nature from Mary the Virgin. And in the Greek text of this creed uh, like statement, we find that he took up the man. And we find the, the, first, the first fixed forms of the early Christian creeds in their Belize papyrus. The papyrus is from the 6th, 7th century, but the creed on it uh, is going back to the 3rd century. But I believe in God the Father Almighty and in your only begotten Son, our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, in the res resurrection of flesh, and in the Holy Catholic Church. And we see here in the right side, the Greek text of this uh, early creed. And here see that the 
epitheton of Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God and our Lord, and these two, that the only begotten Son and our Lord became standard epitheton of Jesus Christ, but here we don't find any mention of the content of incarnation and the manner of incarnation. But in the interrogative uh, creed of Hippolytus of Rome, we find that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Here, this is his epitheton and the content of incarnation that he is born of Holy Spirit from Mary the Virgin. These two statements uh, are used to explain um, what, what the incarnation of Jesus Christ uh, is like. He is born of the Holy Spirit from Mary the Virgin. And in the old Roman creed, in Vetus Symbolum Romanum, uh, we find two different formulations. It is said that the original Proto-Roman creed, as reconstructed by uh, Luva Vestra, is et credo in Christum Jesum, I believe in Christ, Jesus, filium eius, his son, quinatus est, who is born of the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. And this is uh, to be found in the version of Marcellus of Ancyra. that we believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, our Lord, who is born from the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. And this is the version which is closer to the version of Rufinus. Et in Christum Jesum filium eius unicum, dominum nostrum, and in Jesus Christ, his uh, only, only son, our Lord, Quinatus Est, who is born of the Holy Spirit from Mary the Virgin. With the time, this uh, Roman creed has developed into many so-called daughter creeds in various Western churches. And uh, regarding to the passage on incarnation, there are two main variants. And uh, here I um, point out the two variants which is found in the Church of Milano, the version of Ambrose, Ambrosius. We believe in Jesus Christ, his um, only son, our Lord, who is born of the Holy Spirit from, and here we have the preposition from, Mary the Virgin. And this, ver this version is used in Aquileia, in Ravenna, in Turin, in Remesiana, in Hippo, in Cartago, in Ruspe, and in many other churches. The version that is found in works of Augustine formulates in another way, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who is born of the Holy Spirit and, and here he don't use the preposition X from, but the conjunction it and, the who is born of the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. And this version is uh, more characteristic to the churches in Hispania, but in the Mozarabic liturgy, we found a, a variation of this formulation. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, 
who is born of the Holy Spirit from ex utero Maria Virginis, from the womb of Mary the Virgin. And in the church of, of uh, Gallia, we find a new element in the creed concerning the incarnation. And that is that Jesus Christ is conceived from the Holy Spirit and born from Mary the Virgin. And this is to be found in Faustus of Ries, in Cyprianus of Toulon, and Caesarius of Arle. And in uh, every, each of these three creeds we find, we conceptus est the Spiritus Sancto Natus ex Maria Virgine. The Syria creeds have a special language, the special manner of speaking about the incarnation. And uh, in these creeds, we, we read that he put on a body from Mary the Virgin of the seed of the house of David from the Holy Spirit and put on our manhood. Or he put on a body and become man from Mary the Virgin. And we, we have arrived to the ecumenical councils. These are the creeds that have the most complex formulation on the incarnation. And in these creeds, Jesus Christ is named the Son of God, begotten of the Father, and the Council of Constantinople adds to it before all the ions. He is light of light, God of God, begotten and not made consubstantial with the Father by whom all the things were made. And it adds also a theological reason of the incarnation who for us men and for our salvation came down, came, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary and was made man. We see that this formulation is the most complex and this is which became standard in the Eastern churches but uh, we can see that in some Greek-speaking churches, we have creeds uh, that are more likely to the Western creeds. And uh, only one example that is not on the slide is the creed of the creed of Nike from Trachia. And here we read that he is born from the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin, as it is written in the scriptures. As a conclusion, we can say that uh, the formulation of the teaching on incarnation is shaped by theological debates on Trinity and Christology, and it is a development from the most simple formulation that Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is Lord and Son of God into the direction of the more complex statements. Among the epitatons of the incarnated Logos, we find that he is Son of God and our Lord. And uh, regarding uh, to the content of incarnation, that he is from Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin, in the earliest we find that he is born from the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. Later, he is born of the Holy Spirit from Mary. And I think that this is uh, in order to avoid any idea of hierogamy. And the final form that is to be found in the churches of Gallia, that he is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of Mary. And later in the fourth century, uh, appear remarks regarding to his nature, 
in order to demonstrate, to demonstrate his uh, homoousia with the father and in order to show the reason of his incarnation that it has happened for us and for our salvation. Thank you very much for your kind attention and Merry Christmas to you. That was really interesting, dear Georgi, and uh, we saw a beautiful categorization of uh, the early Christian quids. Uh, so now, uh, since we have time, uh, we would like to... Uh, first, uh, Mr. Kalogerakis, would you like to add anything or say something? I would like to thank all these speakers, and especially you, uh, Zoe, for these uh, very fruitful contributions today. I think that uh, it's very nice that you have recorded this discussion, so it will be widely available for the people who are interested in this kind of issues, uh, because we have, from a different point of view, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the perspectives that will be very interesting for researchers and uh, students, of, for, of course, and uh, uh, for people who are interested in this kind of uh, uh, issues. So a big thank you uh, for all the speakers and to you, Zoe. Thank you very much. I would like also to thank uh, today's speakers uh, for all these beautiful and insightful uh, presentations. And I certainly hope that we have uh, the chance to do it again. <laughs> and now in another conference, of course. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yanis? No? Okay. <laughs> I would like to say something about uh, the lecture of uh, Georgi. Yes. I was very impressed, impressed uh, of uh, it. Uh, and I think uh, this lecture is a very good answer to the first lecture. Uh, uh, there is no other words because uh, it was uh, very, very important to say that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, is not uh, semi God, but uh, is a very uh, complicated uh, figure in uh, Christian mythology. And uh, this is a uh, mystery uh, religion, uh, not some simple mythology. And it was very important to, to say this. You're right. You're absolutely right, yeah. Uh, yes, Mark, you have a question? Yes, it's a, it's along similar lines. I think uh, that please turn off your microphone. Turn on your microphone. I'm sorry. Oh, I think it, it is on. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good, good. Um, I think what George says is uh, it is important. I think also to realize that this comes out of a Jewish background, you know, and one can talk about the parallels, and one can see very important correspondences between the Greek world and the philosophical world and also other forms of religious um understanding of 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 Osiris and, and and this but the original I think is is fairly not saying that that the Jewish world was completely closed from all other influences but it does seem that when you just look at the Gospels there's not a real awareness of these myths or these uh, philosophical currents that that can come later in, in christian interpretation but in terms of influence i think maybe that's not quite the right word to to use so that was something i would if mark had still been here we might have had a, a nice discussion ab about that but i also see it in what george said about the the resistance to the idea of a hierogami you know this very careful thing to make sure that although augustine is a little bit slightly more relaxed about this uh it seems that the development the more uh, people who are much more sharply thinking about these things want to make sure that it's not the spirit and and Mary coming together in some kind of union. Um, they have they so they have different tasks to play. It's not a kind of a man and a woman kind of equivalence in in terms of the production of Jesus. I think that's 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 not unimportant. I think and I'd like to see if, I, if George or someone's going to do more research on this. I'd be very interested to see that. 
So thank you. I just want to say that, and, and you know, I learned so much from the, um, you know, about the the history that, that we were getting from from Vanya as well. Uh, um, this very important thing. I just want to know where does where does Epiphany come from? But then I think JJ uh, was able to kind of help us with that a little bit to see why Epiphany is important. Um, so it was all piecing together. I think that was very useful for me. So thank you. Yes, you're right. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, do we have any other questions? No, okay, none of the speakers. When shall we have uh, another conference about Christmas? <laughs> this is the question. Hopefully next year. <laughs> I hope. Okay, so I guess we can now close uh, the conference uh, if we, we don't have any other questions or comments or observations. Uh, I would uh, like to thank you all again for your contribution in uh, this conference. If it wasn't for you, uh, the con this conference would <laughs> not have been held at all. And uh, hopefully see you next year at another Christmas event. Okay, so I guess now we say goodbye, Mr. Kalugirakis. Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas, of course, and a blessed new year. Happy Christmas. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Roy. Thank you.